Okay, so there's a symbol that you might see here, R to the N. See that, R to the N? Yes. When you see R to the N, it means a real coordinate space of N dimensions. N dimensions. For example, if you just see an R all by its lonely self, you can assume it's a one-dimensional space. You know, like a line. It has a left and a right. That's one dimension. Remember, left and right is not two dimensions. It's one dimension. Uh, R2 means a two-dimensional space, or we call it, you know, 2D. And that would be something that has two perpendicular real number lines that you can measure. And R3 means a three-dimensional space. So when we draw in 3D, because we're drawing on flat paper, when you draw in 3D, you're going to have to just kind of make do with your two-dimensional graph, uh, you know, regular paper, and just kind of make it look 3D. So we often do that by drawing two axes that are, you know, about, about 60 degrees apart, and then draw a z-axis, which is another 30 degrees, another uh, 30, 60 degrees apart. Just something like this, maybe. All together, looks like about 120 degrees in here. But it's really supposed to look 3D, okay? You've done it before, too, right? Didn't we do a little bit of that drawing? When we were trying to graph and then uh, do volumes. And I gave you that special paper. And you'll see that special paper, for, paper further down. OK, so if somebody asks you to graph x equals 0 now, that is now a trick question. Because if they say, hey, graph x equals 0, you might ask them, well, which space do you want me to draw it in? If they say graph it in r, then you should be graphing a number line and putting a dot at 0. That's x equals 0. That's what a 7th grader would tell you, right? If you said, hey, graph x equals 0, they wouldn't draw a line. They would just draw a dot on the number line. Right? The number line is called the x number line. If you graph it in two dimensions, or we call that r squared, or r2. It's actually pronounced r2, not r squared. If you graph it in r2, it looks like this. It's all of these points. Why do we get so many of them? <clears throat> it's because there is no specific value for y mentioned, right? Notice that y is mentioned, therefore it can be anything. So the absence of the variable y here is shouting out a truth to us that y can be anything. So when something's missing, it is, we say that the equation is symmetric in that variable and we can add put in any y we want. Okay, which brings us to the three space case for x equals zero. What would that look like? What is the three dimensional equivalent of x equals zero? Well, x equals zero says nothing of y, right? There's no mention of what y is. There's no mention of what z is. So any point on this, um, well, in these octants, I guess you say, any, any point in this space where x is 0 counts as a solution. It's, a plane. it's actually a sheet. Yes, it's a plane. So x equals 0 is, of course, at the origin. It's this line, as we saw in R2. But it's also any point above this line, you see. So this is like the x equals 0 sheet. Does that make sense? Yep. We're doing this in the CAD class. Good. Yeah, good. So we have, we have not done this much together in high school because, well, we've been doing everything in two dimensions. So it's really intimidating when you get to college and, and the professors are drawing a bunch of 3D stuff. That's really intimidating. And it seems kind of unfair that you guys don't even get to see it once, even in high school. That seems unfair to me. OK, see if you can draw x equals 2 now. Why don't you guys try it? Try drawing x equals 2 in one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions. Basically the same problem. Shift it over. So the only difference is in R1s or R space, 
you're just going to be putting a point uh, at x equals 2 instead of x equals 1 on the number, uh, instead of x equals 0 on the number line. So just basically right there. And that's in one space. In two space, or 2D, we call it, x equals 2 is actually this line here, as you know. Right? And you should label your axes, so x and y. OK, and then the third case, draw your x, y, z axis system. This is called a right-handed coordinate system, by the way. A right-handed coordinate system. Do not switch the x and y axes around, <laughs> OK? If you switch the labels on here, you might want to pay attention to this. If you switch the x and y around, what happens is the z should be pointing downwards. Have you guys learned the right-hand rule in physics? OK. Well, the right-hand rule in physics, the way Ms. Fisco uses it, is to show you, if you're doing the e &M section, the direction that a, like a magnetic field uh, is pointing when the current is running through a wire. OK? Or if you used it for like torque and angular acceleration, that sort of thing. I think she uses her fingers. And she aims them like in the vector r's direction, and then she crosses that with the vector f by curling her fingers, and then her thumb is naturally pointing in the direction of r cross f, the torque, right? Um, you can also just use these three fingers in general, just without curling your fingers. Just kind of hold your hand like this, okay? The, make sure it's your right hand. <laughs> Don't do your left hand. That won't work at all. Uh, your fourth finger is the x-axis. Your middle finger is the y-axis, so fingers 1 and 2 are x and y. And then your thumb is the z. So you can see that if you were to try to switch the uh, two fingers around, the x and the y fingers, you're going to naturally have to switch the direction you hold your z. So what I'm saying is you really need to draw it like this or just kind of spin it as a mufflet, we call it. Okay. So... I'll use that word again later in this lesson. So x equals 2 is this line and anything above it or below it. Hunter's drawing is better than mine. But, you know, you got a little, little bit of perspective drawing there if you can. Raise your hand if you kind of had that one in the right spot. Looks pretty good. Okay. Let's go to... Um, y equals negative 2x plus 4. So you cannot draw that in one space because it has two variables. So once you guys draw what you think it is, well, obviously you know what it is in two space, but see if you can draw the two space and three space scenarios for y equals negative 2x plus 4. This is example three now. space. It's going to be a little harder to draw in 3D. So what you kind of need to do is I mean, don't get angry, but you're going to have to tick off your axes. You have to tick off your axes. <laughs> if you draw the, um, the line y equals negative 2x plus 4, it's supposed to look like it's connected to the y-axis back here at 4. And to the x-axis over here at 2, so these are points of contact with the two axes. My drawing lacks some kind of perspective, I think, but the blue means it's contacting the axes there. And then any line above this, 
So this forms a sheet above and below this. It's getting harder for me to draw. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> but because Z is absent from this, since Z isn't mentioned, we just have to assume it can be anything, which <coughs> means we get not just one line, but an infinite number of lines above and below that first line we drew. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so there's all kinds of words now that we could introduce. Like, there's no such thing as slope anymore, right? We just entered the world of 3D, so there's no slope anymore. Rise over run doesn't mean anything at all. Because are you talking about delta y over delta x? Are you talking about delta z over delta r? You know, radial travel. Like, what, what do you mean by slope? That doesn't even mean anything anymore. And the, it becomes a world of vectors, basically. Everything is vectors. Okay? Which we don't need to get into at all today. We're just sketching these fun little pictures. Uh, raise your hand if you cannot understand my drawing. Okay. So it's basically the line that you drew first, and then anything above it or below it. Okay. Uh, I regret making my parallelogram tilted at all. It should really look parallel to the z-axis. So this should look parallel to the z-axis. It stands straight up and down, you know. Uh, what about y equals, or what about x squared plus y squared equals 9? You know? Yeah, so this would be like a circle. And then the 3D drawing would be circles upon circles upon circles. It's a cylinder, actually. So you've actually just finally seen the equation of a cylinder. Okay, so let's draw the circle radius 3. This is the two space drawing. That's a pretty good circle for freehand. I'm quite proud of my circle. I know, I feel really good about it. And if Melissa says it's a good circle, then it's definitely a good circle. Okay. I think they're remaking that movie. Okay. Hunter hates superhero movies, everyone. That's true. I also hate everyone. That's on, no, that's on YouTube also. Okay. Okay, so this would look, this would be kind of what your circle looks like, you know, from the side, because even though it's technically supposed to be a circle, you're drawing it with perspective. So imagine taking this and just raising it straight up, you know, just lifting it straight off the XY plane. Yeah, yes, you're right. I said that, but I haven't been drawing it. So you could go above and below. No, you're absolutely right. I, I don't want it to. I don't want you to think that these are always positive. Yeah, that is supposed to look like a cylinder. Man, I'm not very good at it. But a cylinder does have an equation, then, right? It certainly does. Uh, to show that it continues upwards forever and continues downwards forever? Okay, so you do like Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think it's implied. You know, a person who looks at that, a person who looks at these lines you draw, right, even if you're fit the arrowhead, they assume it's a line. And a person who looks at a cylinder just assumes it's infinitely long. This is why in geometry, your teachers really shouldn't teach you that a cone is this. I, I don't know. I, I just had some issues with lower education. I mean it, like in Curious George, my son thinks this is a cone. Listen, my son thinks it's a cone because Curious George told him it was. Okay? But a true cone in mathematics has uh, two naps, actually. This is a cone. And these go on forever, like Hunter says. That's a cone. Okay? What you're looking at when you hold an ice cream cone in your hand is a truncated version of that cone. Okay? A cone, by definition, is a line, actually. <laughs> this is what a cone is. Watch my hand. You take a line, you swing it around in a circle. That's a, that's a cone. It's a set of points formed by a line being rotated around an axis. 
So the axis is in the middle. The line is rotating around it. And since lines go on forever, technically this is the better image, that this is a cone. OK? So it's unfortunate. And then Curious George tells my, this is even worse, Curious George tells my son that the cone is blue. Oh, man. Listen, the cone can't have color. The cone is made up of infinitely small points, OK? Which have no color, no size, and no matter for that matter. OK, I don't know. They tell children to point to the blue circle, too, you know? Children, find the blue circle. Neither of these are circles. They're disks. The, <laughs> the circle is the outside part, infinitely thin. It's certainly no size and no color, for crying out loud. So these are issues I plan to take up with PBS someday. No, not really. <laughs> we all know what they mean, right? Can you draw the hyperbola case? The hyperbola? It's a fun one to draw. X squared minus Y squared equals 9. Okay, I'll help you with the 2D one. You extend it to 3D. So any hyperbola that starts with X squared and then it goes minus Y squared is going to be centered at the origin. You can draw that box thing if you want. It's going to be a little hard to do in 3D anyway. Just drawing this in 3D is going to be hard. So drawing the asymptote lines is completely optional. But in this particular case, since if you divide everything by 9, since these two denominators are identical, we can assume that these two lines each have slope 1 and negative 1. So that box, you could say, is a 6 by 6 square. And these are the diagonals of it, if you'd like to draw the box. OK, but my point is, let's see if we can draw this in 3D now. What would it look like? You really are just lifting it up off of its plane and lowering it onto, into the bottom of you know, under the plane, is the idea. So I'll work on my drawing while you guys work on yours. Okay, turn the screen. Can I turn the screen up? I want to see if I can do it without you. Yeah, go ahead and close that. Okay, this is a challenge now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I liked your first drawing. The uh, plane was good. That's what made you fun of me just today. Just that was the app joke you said then. <laughs> I can promise you your drawing is better than mine, even if it stinks. Okay. Computers do a nice job with this stuff, don't they? The computer's drawings in your books look so great. By the way, our textbook is kind of funny. Uh, you won't find any of this stuff in that book because it was only designed to get you through the AP test. But almost every other, even high school math book, if you go right to the next section, this is the kind of stuff you're learning. So. lifted up off the plane. Okay, so we're not really talking anymore about uh, plane curves, but now we're in 3D space. So, all right. Let's take a look at the next page here. Now that we've practiced our drawing. Oh, by the way, one more question. So what, what is the absence of the Z shouting out to us? What is it? What is the absence of a variable declare loudly to us? You think a variable that's absent is silent, large. but it's not. It's saying it's something. Large in that. Okay. The fact that there is no, like when you guys take your physics test next Monday, okay, <laughs> you're going to have an opportunity, I'm sure, to use something like this, the period of a pendulum, right? What's, what's missing in this 
formula that surprises some people is M. You might expect that the period of a pendulum motion depends on what kind of object you hang on the pendulum, right? But it doesn't. So the absence of M is saying M can be anything. And the same thing is true here. The absence of Z means Z can be anything. So always look for the absolute, absent variable. I know it's kind of an oxymoron, but look for what's missing because it's actually teaching us something about that drawing. Okay, now how do you measure in the world of 3D? Well, many ways have been devised. Um, the th there are three that we're going to learn, okay? But if you are in three-dimensional space, you have to use three numbers to find anything. Okay, it's kind of like if you were on the corners of, you know, Tustin and Chapman. Tustin and Chapman. I think there's an Arco station right here. I work literally there. <laughs> yeah, you work a couple blocks north of there. That's no, right. I work next to the Arco station. <laughs> yeah. Do you get your gas there? Yeah. Okay. So here's the Arco station on the corner of Tustin and Chapman. So let's say that you were just, I don't know, maybe just hanging out on the roof for some reason. You're sitting out on the roof, okay? And you call your friend and you're like, hey, I'm at the corner of Tustin and Chapman. Well, you could actually give them like coordinates for that, you know, like GPS coordinates, two, two angles or whatever. Well, they can just Google it and find it anyway, but they'll, they'll get the coordinates and their GPS will lead them right to the spot. So they get there and they're like looking around, they're like, I don't see you, where are you? And you're like, I'm up on the roof. Okay. <laughs> what are you doing up there? I don't know. Okay. But you see, a third number is required to really declare the position of that person. You need a third number. You need the X and Y, you know, to find the intersection. But you also need a Z to tell where vertically the person is. And this is true in 3D. We always need three numbers to declare where something is. So... What I'm saying on this first bullet is each point in n-dimensional space has to be determined by n variables. There's no way to find a person in a 3D realm given two numbers. That's impossible. I mean, if I wanted you to point to a specific spot on this xy plane, I wouldn't give you one number, right? So in two dimensions, you need two numbers. So in three dimensions, you need three numbers, and so on. If you were in hyperspace, four-dimensional world, you would need four numbers to find your spot. Okay? All right. For example, on a number line, only one number is needed, one variable. In two dimensions, two are needed. You could put two uh, values or two variables. And in in the world of rectangular, I'm sorry, in the world of 2D, this is R2, both of these drawings are uh, two space. We've already seen two different ways to find a point. For example, some people would say, okay, this is one, two, three, four, comma, three, you know? Somebody might call this point four, three. Somebody else might take the exact same place on the plane, and instead of calling it four, three, They could use polar coordinates, right? So they could say, no, I don't want to call that 4, 3. I'm going to call it um, 5, comma, 37 degrees. Well, it's the 3, 4, 5 triangle, just the one, one of the very few I have memorized. 37.13 degrees. Or no, 37.87 degrees. Anyway, about 37. <laughs> I think it's 37.87. But you see, there's nothing wrong with either system. They're both great ways to find that point. And how many numbers do you use in the first system, first measurement system? Two, three, and a four, a four and a three, right, an X and a Y. How many do you need to find a spot using the polar system? Two. Two. You need two numbers, period. Doesn't matter if it's an angle and a distance or two distances. You're not going to be able to describe it using fewer numbers. So two variables. And see, there's two systems here. So you can imagine what would happen when we get into the 3D realm. Like, how do you find points in 3D? Well, there's a lot of ways to do it. We're going to talk about uh, rectangular coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, and spherical coordinates. Okay? 
And that's what I have down here. Okay, so let me just give you a really rough drawing of each one, and then we'll go on the next page and we'll lay it out in detail how to find everything. So if I said three, four, five, okay, you would probably just assume that means X, Y, Z. Okay? So notice, watch closely, my X is here now. You see that? My Y is here. My Z is here. This is still a right-handed coordinate system, but the Z is coming out at us. Okay? So be careful. Watch for that X. Okay? That means the positive side. Okay, so three. You count three this way. So one, two, three. And then four. You count four into the positive Y direction, which is the right side, right direction. One, two, three, four. And then when you count upwards, don't go over, don't do this. Don't tick off your Z axis. Okay, and then say, oh, okay, I'm going to put my point way up here. That's like 10 spaces up. Okay, here's what you did wrong. The distance right here is 4. But when you translate that over to this point, it's going to look like that. Okay, so you kind of want to copy and paste the actual physical distance for and place it right here on the XY plane. So actually, the green point is the correct answer, not the, uh, not the red one. The red one's too high up. So just be careful where you start counting from. You start counting from the XY plane up. Okay, so something like that. Okay. Now, you don't have to really draw anything but the point itself. So the problem with that, though, is if you just draw the point, why is this not a very good sketch? Yeah, if you don't draw any trace lines, or I like to call them breadcrumb trails, if you don't show how you got to that point, you can't really tell if that's even a point. You might actually be looking at a line, like head on, like this. Look, if you look at this line, right, if you look at this ruler, like from the edge, it looks like a point. So that might just be like one point on a line that we're looking at the edge of, you see? So we don't want that. We want to draw those little trails. And even maybe put numbers on. So write, you know, three, four, five. And then people can clearly see. I don't know why I went up four. I was supposed to go up five. We were supposed to go up five spaces, weren't we? So it could be a little higher than I have. Maybe up here. So the black point's more accurate. But you see what's going on there? You draw those and nobody even doubts where it is. It's very obvious. Okay, cylindrical might take that same point and measure it totally differently. So let's just say I told you, hey, I've got this point. Right here, okay? And I put three, four, five on here. And you might look at that and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you're doing. You're like, I know how you got there. You basically went out here to this point from the origin. You just did this in two travels. You just went basically from the origin to here, and then you went straight up. Is that what you did? It's like, no, no, no. I did like this three-part motion, three, four, five. Someone might say, well, why don't you just take a shortcut next time? Just do blue, blue. That takes you to this point, doesn't it? Okay, that's called cylindrical coordinates. Okay? So this is like the point R theta, you know. And this point up here is like R theta Z. It's kind of like polar, r theta, and then it's got the extra z element. So the point r theta z is above the point r theta zero, or r theta. Roz. Roz, okay. So what happens is when you measure in this way, all your points are measured like, you know, a certain distance from the origin and then straight up. You know, or maybe this way, and then straight up. So you're going to end up with what's kind of like a cylindrical look. Your motions are either radially outwards from this axis, 
and then in a certain direction, and then straight up or straight down. So it forms like this cylindrical look. Okay, spherical is measured a third way altogether. So this is the point three, four, five. If somebody looked at that, they'd say, oh yeah, I know how you did that. You just basically travel straight shot from the pole, from the origin. One motion, bam. Well, if you do that, if you just give one distance, you're going to need to provide two angles. Yeah. So this distance is like a radial distance. But now you need to give me two angles to tell me which direction that thing points in. So the two most commonly given angles are the ones people tend to go with are this theta again because, well, theta is something we're familiar with. We're used to measuring from the x-axis. We've been doing it for like three years. Algebra 2, theta was measured from the x-axis. Pre-calc, theta is measured from the x-axis, right? Polar coordinates, theta is measured from the x-axis. And then you need to give me the angle from the z-axis. And you need to, of course, give me this distance. So instead of using R, because that might get confused with the cylindrical world, we use rho, which you've seen as density before. And we list them in this order. Almost every textbook does rho, theta, phi. There are very few textbooks that do rho, phi, theta. But almost always it goes rho, theta, phi. Rho is the distance from the origin. Theta is the angle to the x-axis. And phi is the angle to the y-axis. Okay, and just so you know, phi is often written in cursive. Okay, so let's practice our Greek handwriting, shall we? This is theta, and this is the cursive version. Okay, this is phi, or phi. I don't care if you call it phi, or phi, or pho, or pho. <laughs> okay, and this is the cursive version. But because they look sort of similar, phi and theta, especially when they're written in cursive, people get them mixed up. So let's write at least five phi's, okay? So here's what you have to draw. You go like this first, like you're writing letter C, and you come back down and through. You, can, you don't even have to connect it if you want. Kind of fun to draw. And I'm sure if I had a... Uh, if I was Greek, my teacher would be slapping me on the wrist for not drawing it well. Kind of like my Chinese preschool teacher slapped me on the wrist when I couldn't write my name in Chinese very well. Oh, those were the days. Okay? I did get hit on the hand with a ruler. Okay. Are you being a bad boy? I'm sure I was. Three different ways of measuring the exact same point. Give me three distances, give me a distance and two angles, or give me two angles, or give me uh, one angle and two distances. Those are kind of the accepted three ways to measure. So here's our next page where we get into the details of how to convert from x, y, z to r theta phi to r theta z. Okay, rho theta phi, r theta z. Let's look first at converting from regular rectangular x, y, z. Imagine trying to convert that to the cylindrical world, r theta z. Well, I have good news for you. The z is the same z. So whether you're converting from rectangular to cylindrical or from cylindrical to rectangular, you get to keep your z value. It's the same exact definition in both worlds. Okay, theta is this angle right here, literally. So we've always used you've always used inverse tangent of y over x in the past, and you get to use it now, too. Okay? Don't forget, very, very important, to add 180 if x is negative. This is a calculator thing. Sometimes your calculator, you'll type in, like, inverse tan of negative 0.6 or whatever. And your calculator will give you an angle, but it's not in the right quadrant. It's not really the calculator's fault. It's the calculator doesn't understand quadrants 2 and 3 at all when, when doing an arctan. It's been trained to think quadrants 1 and 4. So 
It's not really the calculator's fault. But you have to add 180 if x is negative. And that's very, very important. And you've also measured r before in the xy plane. It's just the square root of x squared plus y squared. So actually, none of these formulas are new at all. <coughs> this is the, if you cover up the z, these are the polar equation, or the, the conversion from rectangular to polar that you've been using for a year and a half, right there. The z equals a just means now we're going to include that third element. That would have been a message for my wife. OK, uh, now let's look at cylindrical to rectangular. How do you work this in reverse? Well, you want, you're basically going from r theta z now to x, y, z. So you can steal the z value. You don't need to interpret that. But remember, r, x is a r cos theta. That rule still holds true. And y is r sine theta. So what you are looking at is exactly the rules you've used all along for rectangular to polar conversion and vice versa, with the exception of the z being added in. And there's a couple vocabulary words you need to know. Obviously, r is just the distance to the origin R is the, actually technically it's the distance to the z-axis. Remember, this is the point we're interested in up here, point P. And when you measure this distance, you're really measuring the fastest way to get to the z-axis. So this red segment, we either down at the bottom in the xy plane or up at the top. Either way, it represents the distance to the z-axis, you see. Theta is the angle to the x-axis, really. And this is called the azimuth angle. Azimuth. Don't ask. Or the azimuthal angle. As I spelled that wrong. Azimuthal. So azimuth is the noun, I believe. And azimuthal is technically the ad adjective. So... It's in the xy plane. It's really not very hard to do cylindrical coordinates because you're very familiar with polar coordinates. And it's the same thing with another z number. OK, let's talk about spherical now. This gets a lot more complicated because there's two angles going on. OK, so in this picture, You don't plan on measuring all the same things as before. This is still r, you see. And this is still x right here. And this is still y. And this is still theta, you know. But you're not going to use all of this stuff when you describe the spherical world. And this, you know, is still z right here. So the blue are your uh, Cartesian coordinates. The red are your cylindrical coordinates. But we have a brand new system altogether in the spherical. So in the spherical, we plan on actually measuring all the greens. If you want to find rho, that's this length, basically, from the origin to this point, you can use kind of the three-dimensional version of Pythagoras' rule. So this is literally just square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. If you don't believe me that that works, um, go back and look in your SAT prep book. Okay? It explains why. All right. Um, theta, well, theta is the same angle we used back in the cylindrical. So you can still use arctan y over x. And don't forget to add the 180 if x is negative. And I'm going to stick with degrees. One of the reasons is because that way, when I write an answer, you'll see, oh, that's an angle. If I write 1.3, you might think that's a, like a distance. Or it could be 1.3 radians, you know. But if I write, you know, 58.7 degrees, you're going to know that's an angle. Okay, and then phi. Phi is the hardest one to measure. Watch very closely. Okay, I'm going to use the red marker just for a second. Watch. Phi is one of the angles in this right triangle here. Isn't that true? This red right triangle. And z shows up right here. 
So you basically have, for phi, it's the angle between rho and z. And the red on top there, that segment is r, right here. Or the square root of x squared plus y squared from earlier. So that's this segment down here, you see. This is square root of x squared plus y squared, and it's on the top as well. They're parallel and congruent. So if you want to use just x's and z's and y's and things like that to write rho, or to write phi, I mean, uh, you're going to want to write probably this. It is the inverse cosine of adjacent over hypotenuse. So it's inverse cosine of z over square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. This hypotenuse is square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The adjacent is z, and the, the phi is sandwiched between the adjacent and the hypotenuse. So if that one's too hard to see, I'll, I'll write it again over here. Phi is inverse cosine of, and then it's z over square root x squared, y squared, z squared. And that's one of our three ingredients in spherical, so it's very, very important we have a formula for that guy. Okay, now spherical to rectangular. This is sort of the other way around, you know. Trying to go from rho theta phi back to x, y, z world. Well, notice when you calculate angles, you often use tangents and inverse tangents. And all. Uh, when you calculate the sides, you probably end up using cosine and sine. Okay? Okay, so what is, how does x relate to theta? I like how does x relate to theta? And uh, how does y relate to theta, that sort of thing. So first thing you have to understand is, I need to redraw a little. You probably can't right now because you have too much going on. But this is r from cylindrical world, remember? And this is z. And this is rho. And this angle right here was phi. But there's another phi in this picture, and it's right here. It's an alternate interior with this phi. Okay? So that phi right there, r is across from it, z is its adjacent, and rho is like a hypotenuse. This is the hardest one to see, I think, of, the, of them all. So this r that's down here that we use in cylindrical world, since this is rho and this is phi, this is also phi, this down here is also rho sine phi. Not only is it r, it's also rho sine phi, technically. If you look at that right triangle there. Okay, so since x, remember, was r cos theta, we can now write rho sine phi cos theta. It's really just r cos theta is what I just wrote. And remember, y is always r sine theta. And z is rho cos theta. I meant to say rho cos phi. This is the most complicated one to kind of visualize. But basically, this is just an old... The old uh, r cos theta, r sine theta, but now we're calling it rho sine phi. And the last one is rho cos phi. From this blue triangle, you can kind of see it. Z is sort of the adjacent sandwiched between phi, and, or where phi is sandwiched between rho and z. So most people just memorize these, and they just, as soon as possible, they get them onto like a note card to study off of, because it's just so much to memorize. Okay, what about rho? What is it by definition? It is the distance to the origin, yeah. Or from the origin, right. Theta is still called the azimuthal angle. And phi has a name too, it's called the polar angle. I think it's a very unfortunate name. 
Maybe it's because on the earth, the North Pole, right, might be where you measure from, you know? So you might actually measure from the North Pole to London. If you had to call some angle the polar angle, maybe it would be the angle from Santa Claus's house to London, you know? That would be like the polar angle. Maybe that's why they chose that name, I don't know. But from North Pole to London, that angle is called the polar angle. Okay, so there's, there's some vocab there, there's some new sketches for you. Uh, there's some, some formulas we definitely got to record and get, you know, get memorized. And uh, what we're going to do is convert, a lot of converting for the first couple lessons. So, all right, so that's just the first lesson is just sketching. And the next lesson is to actually use it. So you don't really have homework tonight. You can try the conversions if you want. Put your calculator in degrees mode, I would just recommend.